So our next speaker is from NYU Tandon School of Engineering from the Digital Future Lab. His focus for this talk will be using engineering and AI to build the next gen of smart scopes capable of diagnostic support. And fun little fact, on his spare time, he does 3D print graffiti artists in the style of green army men. I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> All right, so uh, presenting their talk, Microscopes Are Stupid. I agree. <laughs> Here is Luba Gusty. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming to see this speech on the Microscopes Are Stupid. Uh, my name is Lou August. I, I work at NYU Tandon School of Engineering in uh, their future labs. So it's really, I'm an entrepreneur in residence there. Uh, they incubate my company. I've been running it there for three years now, and we work on solving this problem. So just a little bit before we get started, uh, we've won some awards over the last couple of years. We won the ASME Award for Best Hardware Prototype in 2015. Uh, last year we were nominated for Science Startup of the Year by this uh, competition out in Germany called Falling Walls. Uh, we won the Indian government's endowment for science research last year, and this year we're finalists for Qualcomm's uh, prize, Design in India. Uh, I published my methods in the British Medical Journal in 2015 uh, on how to make, use smartphones to create whole slide images. And uh, I did a preclinical validation study of that information in uh, 2016, which I presented at USCAP, which is the United States and Canada Anatomical Pathologist Society. And this year we received IRB approval to do our clinical validation study, which I'm writing up right now. So yes, microscopes are stupid. I, I said it, and that's it. Um, if you look at this microscope here, it's such a dinosaur that it's not even connected to the internet. <laughs> so, basically the problem is microscopes are dependent on the operator and who's operating that microscope. And the problem that we're facing is as we look out at more and more in the healthcare landscape in the world, we find that there are things called healthcare deserts. These are places in America, the developing world, where options for healthcare don't exist. And it's not that they don't have microscopes, they have microscopes. They don't have anyone that could help them do diagnosis. So this is very true, as I said, in Kentucky, as just as true as it is in Haiti, just as true as it is in India. So before we go forward, I wanted to give a shout out to my boy Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Um, he's, he's like the G of microscopes. So basically, he was born in the 1500s, and 40 years before he was born, they had created the compound microscope. Uh, Leeuwenhoek was a tradesman, and he was actually into glass working. He didn't have any advanced degrees, he didn't uh, have a PhD, so he was eliminated from a lot of the science community. But what he did was he created, with his knowledge of glass blowing or glass making, he created this microscope here. And this microscope had a magnification of over 200 times magnification. Uh, up to that point, they had already invented the compound microscope, which is very similar to what we see today in any laboratory but that only had a magnification of 20 to 30 times magnification. So von Leeuwenhoek was definitely one of the first disruptors, and he's also considered the father of microbiology because of what he was able to see uh, through his microscope that he created. And in fact, it wasn't really until the 1800s that they made any advancements past what he made with this microscope here. So also humans are stupid, <laughs> because uh, when we're given the task we get, humans get tired and they miss things. And diagnosis itself depends on memory. So you probably can't see this right here because the screen's a little bit contrasty. But if you were looking for cancer on this thing, there's actually a monkey in the upper right hand corner of the lung that most people miss when they're looking for cancer. So I'm not sure if you could see that here, but that's usually a good example of how people miss things that are obvious uh, when they're doing something that's repetitive. So a little history on telepathology, uh, which is sort of what we do. So this is 1986. This was the first demonstration of a robotic microscope. And you can only imagine the satisfaction that this man felt clutching those keys and hearing those sweet clicking sounds <laughs> as he moved the microscope around. 
And really, the, the history of telepathology is, is sort of a history of the internet uh, in many ways as well. Because as things improved with the internet, we were able to do more and more in terms of uh, sharing slides, and then virtually moving on to creating virtual slides and sharing those slides over the cloud. And now with uh, things like TensorFlow, we're actually getting to the point where we can deploy uh, AI locally on the device. And that's a big step, I think, that's happening right now in the telepathology industry. So really, the work I've done over the last four years has been focused on uh, helping health outcomes in the developing world and solving the problems that they're facing. And so one of the biggest problems we look at is this really simple equation. Lost time equals lost lives. So there's a worldwide shortage of pathologists or doctors able to make diagnosis. And because of that, people can't get diagnosed. And so if people can't get diagnosed, they can't begin treatment. And the later you wait to begin treatment, the worse your health outcome is going to be. So a lot of the research we've done is creating just simple ratios when we look and see how many specialists there are in a country versus um, how many people there are. And so you can see that in the US, you've got a ratio of basically one to 17,000. But then if you look at a country like China, you've got one to 58,000. And then if you look at a country like Haiti, you've got one to 1,375,000. So you can see that there's just not enough doctors to make diagnosis for all these people. And there's also things that happen when you're in one of these countries that has a small number of doctors. You could actually fix your price as one of those doctors, and your price can be a lot higher than it would be in another country. And so not only are those people not able to get access, but they have to pay a lot more money for access to diagnosis. So the College of American Pathologists states that between 70, well, 60 and 70 percent of all diseases need a diagnosis using you know, uh, some sort of uh, cellular biology. And that includes cancer, uh, things like malaria, uh, a lot of diseases that we know today. Anyway, so another thing we've, we've studied is this travel burden. And a lot of people have done studies here in America. And so we have three, three studies here, one from Kentucky, one from Illinois, and one from Georgia. And basically, all these studies stated that people that lived uh, at a far distance away from the primary diagnosis center, they would get staged for cancer much later. And so that's a big thing that we're facing. So like I said, if it takes you a long time to get a diagnosis, you're probably going to get diagnosed much later when it's going to be much more difficult to cure. So to give you an example of, of one of the patients that I saw when I was down in Haiti, so we had this woman come about three years ago and present herself, and she had a breast mask. And so we had a, a surgeon at the hospital who was able to do a biopsy for her, but there was no one available that could look at her specimen once we had it. So we gave her her specimen in a jar, and we gave her instructions on how to get to the nearest laboratory. And so that laboratory is about six, seven hours away, and she never made that visit. So a couple of years later, she came back in, and this time the mass had grown so large that it actually had ulcerated out of her breast. So now you see we definitely can say, okay, well, this, you know, this was without, without a doubt is going to be breast cancer right here. But when we first saw her, when she first presented herself, when she only had a small mass, we could have used diagnostic testing to prove that it was breast cancer at that point. And consequently, we could have started treatment much earlier. And that's sort of an example of what happens. Also, it's important to note that the cost of testing, uh, diagnostic testing in Haiti, is $50 per test. So that's like a, a really important number uh, to kind of remember. So the previous solutions were like to travel to Port-au-Prince, find a lab, uh, wait a few months, and hopefully get a diagnosis. Uh, what we were doing before, a long time ago, was collecting all the samples, flying them to America, getting a lab to process them in the United States, sending all the results back, and praying that we could find all the people that we had tested while we were down there. Another chance is like the doctor operates based on symptoms, and then really what mostly ends up happening is people die of unknown diseases. So that's pretty heavy, so I just want to chill out for a second. <laughs> um, but we're like, we're working to solve this problem because uh, we know we can. And we know we can use technology to solve this problem. And so 
what we've done is we're, we've been focusing on building new and machine teams. So the vision really is, and it's something that the WHO sort of shares with, shares with us as well, is to create more healthcare workers. Because the paradigm of having a hospital, having a doctor that we know and well love here in America or in other developed nations, it's just not going to work in a lot of these countries. So we have to take people that are willing to go to school for maybe six months to a year, train them at a skill, that could be a skill like becoming a lab tech, and then give them the, the technology they need in order to share those slides so that they could make more diagnosis. And so that's something we've been working on. This is the team that I go down to Haiti with um, from time to time to do that. So another big thing we've been looking at is, okay, so once we can build the capacity for doctors or, or for healthcare workers to prepare specimens, to upload those specimens to the internet, well, who are they gonna share those specimens with? So normally what we did in the past was we shared them with doctors here in America. But doctors in America are really busy. They don't have enough time to look at cases from another hospital, especially if it's not helping them on the bottom line. It's not helping them make more money or do whatever. So what we've actually done is we're working with this team of doctors here in Tanzania. And so these are all doctors, these are all pathologists, the women that you're seeing here. And that's our friend Mumbek. He's also a doctor in Tanzania. And what we've been working is uh, in this hospital, Mulubili in Dar es Salaam, uh, we're setting them up with the technology that they need. So remember when I said it was important, remember that it costs $50 to get a slide diagnosed in Haiti. Well, in Tanzania, the cost of reading a slide is only $12. So already we're saving money for the people that are in Haiti by giving them this option. And the doctors in Tanzania are only making about $700 per month. So they are actually interested in supplementing their income. And they also have an unused capacity because they're sitting in traffic and most of them have drivers. So when they're sitting in traffic, there's time for them, if they're on their tablet or smartphone device, to actually be reviewing cases. So our solution is really to actually send our cases from Haiti to Tanzania to decrease the cost of, of testing so the people in Haiti can afford to pay for testing and they can get a diagnosis quickly. And then hopefully what we'll do is export the lab training program that we're developing in Haiti, export that over to Tanzania, and then create more lab techs and more health workers that can work with what we're building. So that's sort of where we're at. And uh, how we've been accomplishing this right now is we've been developing a system we call SmartScope. So this system basically has two components. It attaches to a regular microscope, and over the eyepiece we have a camera that just fits on the eyepiece. And so that'll fit up to an outer diameter of 44 millimeters. So that'll cover most, most eyepieces that are out there. And then we built this robotic slide holder. And it just attaches with two screws to the side of the uh, like stage of the microscope. So basically with these two uh, pretty simple pieces of technology we've developed over the last three years, uh, we can take a standard microscope and then we could turn it into an IoT device. And so what this is is something that we can deploy at a cost of about $1,000 to $2,000. And on the other side, the companies that were previously building whole slide imaging machines and dynamic microscopes, they were normally charging between $30,000 and $100,000 for one of these standalone devices. And if you've worked in the developing world, you'll know that any sort of standalone device that they have, there's a good likelihood that it's going to be broken by the time you get back there the next time you come down. And there's no one that's going to service these devices. So we've actually created this, this technology really mimicking what we saw in 3D printers. And we've created technology that you can actually repair yourself. So I mean, that's, I think that's a big change right now. And then you can share it on your, your it runs on the cloud, so you can share it on your, your desktop, you can share it on your tablet, or you can even look at it on your smartphone. So uh, how we built it up to this point was we used the Intel Edison. Uh, we thought that was a really good solution for us uh, to start with because it gave us a lot of versatility. Uh, we could run a whole bunch of programs on it. But the one drawback of working with the Edison was that it required us to have a computer uh, to run everything with. So we couldn't sort of do things, everything on the device. And that was sort of where we're at. And we're actually we've been deploying these units into the field, uh, having sort of the more and more uh, use cases for it. So we have hospitals in Indiana that are using it for immunohistochemistry stains. They're just making sure, they're just using it for Q&A, for that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's, it's been good. And so now we're looking at the next, the next, what's next for us? What's next in the future? 
And so, I mean, I think this quote uh, from Freeman Dyson is, is really good. Uh, new directions in science are launched by new tools more than they are by new concepts. The effect of concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways. The effect of tool-driven revolutions is to discover new things that have to be explained. So I, I think in a lot of ways, when Leeuwenhoek uh, went on and developed a microscope that could see at 200 times magnification, then he could explain microbiology. For us, what we see in the vision is not only are we sort of working with this concept of, of people that are, are going to be uh, providing healthcare workers, we're also giving them the tools they need. And we think these tools are powerful enough and cheap enough that they can be deployed at every single laboratory anywhere in the world. And we can create a, a total global network, uh, something that we like to call Skype for microscopes. And this is how we're going to be able to track new diseases as new diseases are emerge into the world. We're going to need to have these capabilities. We can't just send an expert there right away. There's time that it takes to transfer someone there. But having a sort of a network that's really light we can create people around the world that could share this information with a centralized location. And so I think that's sort of like where we're at. So I'll give you a little bit of a demo of how everything works. Uh, let me see, just press the play button there. So this is our new website. It's launching later this month. Uh, basically, once you sign in, you can access any devices that you have permissions to access. And so the devices are there. And then these are invitations, so you can receive invitations to join a session uh, by someone else that has a device. And then once we have everything sort of running, uh, we have this interface here, and you'll see the slide come up in a second. And so what we're able to do is we're able to control the movement of the slide, uh, but we can also do things like add comments. So right now we're adding a comment into this box here. That uh, could be sort of like anything you're seeing on the slide. Uh, you could submit that comment and that's recorded. We can invite people into the session, really simple. So we're gonna invite Carlos right now. He's gonna come in, we're gonna invite him. You can see we have all the information available there. That's running on the local host, so. Um, we have all the information on the slide there and then we could slide that away and then you can view the whole slide. And so that's, this is just a, a feed from a, a regular microscope, uh, just from the eyepiece of the microscope. So obviously, I mean, there's some imperfections. You're seeing dirt and stuff like that. But this was what you would be seeing if you were looking through that eyepiece anyway. So it's a lot of, uh, I mean, it's of clinical quality. It's getting the job done. And it really requires very little IT infrastructure uh, to work in any way. So yeah, I mean, now you're, you're viewing the slide. And this is sort of an example of how we can look at different parts of the slide in order to determine a diagnosis. And then if we see something we like, we can take an image of that, we can add a comment to that image, and then once we add the comment to the image, we'll save that as well. And that just downloads to your computer so you have a copy of it. And the idea basically is once you close out of the session, what you'll be able to do is create a report, and that report would just act as a single lab report, very similar to any sort of lab report you get from any hospital. Uh, it would tell you who was in the session, who started the session, what hospital the session took, it, took place at, and it would tell you any, if any sort of diagnosis was made, and then it would give thumbnails of any images. Okay, cool. So I got about five minutes left. So just finish with this guy, and then we'll move on to the next slide. So that's sort of where we're at in terms of how we see connecting laboratories around the world together. So let me talk to you a little bit about something that's called FlockMind, which I think is pretty interesting. So this was a study that was done. The doctor is like that did it. Not, well, people, some people don't like her. She's like sort of a, one of those figures. But she did this study basically where she took pigeons and she trained the pigeons in order to make diagnosis on breast cancer using images from slides. So the pigeons themselves had an 85% diagnostic accuracy when, when, the, when <laughs> determining cancer. <laughs> But when they took the whole flock of pigeons and then they actually took the result of the flock, they found that it actually raised up to 90, 98%. So it was actually pretty good. But the thing they weren't telling you when I read the article was that they only used a training set. So they trained the, the pigeons on these images and they just gave them the same training images again. They never gave them a testing set. So they sort of tried to hide that data. So I'm gonna tell you that one. But it's still really interesting that with a training set they could have the pigeons make their diagnosis. So that's essentially what we're trying to do right now uh, with AI. So we're using TensorFlow and we're basically creating our own methods of 
detecting cancer. So this is one in particular is for cervical cancer. And we're doing screening programs where we can determine uh, what level of cervical cancer that people are facing. Uh, and we're actually, it's actually going really well. Uh, we're really happy. And we're able to build a lot of data because we have our own slide scanners, which is a big thing that holds up a lot of people in life. And uh, right now, we're working with Qualcomm, as I mentioned before. And the reason why we're really excited about that is because we're trying to actually create a new device altogether. This would be a standalone device that wouldn't need a computer or anything like that. And we really see this as the future of microscopy in a lot of ways. Um, we can do everything that we were talking about before on this device. We could control our motors. We could do everything we want there. Uh, we could run our CV-based image stitching programs. And we can use TensorFlow and AI. And a lot of people are getting at us right now because they have been developing AI and they've been looking for platforms to run it on that are so cheap that they can be deployed into the developing world. And on the conclusion, that's what I'm going to say. Like, it's all going to be good. We're all going to be all right because we're working on solving this problem. <laughs> Thanks very much for your time today. And listening.